Welcome to Mayo Medical Laboratory's Hot Topics. These presentations provide short discussion of current topics and may be helpful to you in your practice. Our speaker for this program is Dr. Glenn Roberts, a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology and microbiology at Mayo Clinic, as well as a consultant in the Division of Clinical Microbiology. Dr. Roberts discusses disease-causing dimorphic fungi and how to identify them in culture. This presentation examines paracoxidomycosis and penicilliosis. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. I have nothing to disclose. The diseases caused by the dimorphic fungi are, as you see here, histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, coccidioidomycosis, paracoxidioidomycosis, sportricosis, and penicillosis. Paracoxidioidomycosis and penicillosis are infections that are generally not found in the United States. All the others are found in North America for sure. In terms of the dimorphic fungi, they all have some features that are similar and include the growth rate. And the growth rate uh, is relative. It depends on, on the organism. It depends on the culture medium. It depends on how much organism is present in the clinical specimen. And textbooks tend to have a tendency to say that there's a fixed amount of time for them to grow, like it takes four to six weeks or something like this. There are times when you see organisms that belong to the dimorphic fungi that will grow in a period of two days because of the sheer amount of organism present in the clinical specimen. Another thing that's in common with the, all the dimorphic fungi is that some of them require some blood enrichment for recovery. And so we always include a medium containing blood so that we pick up that occasional fastidious organism. In terms of the microscopic morphology, these dimorphic fungi are made up of small septate hyphae. And so when you see that, it's pretty of a good indication that that's what you're dealing with, although it's not an absolute. And we have nucleic acid probes and sequent nucleic acid sequencing, and now Malditoff that will help us to identify these organisms so that we don't have to use traditional microscopic morphologic features for identification. But for many of us, that's still the way we identify them, I and it probably will be the way they'll be identified for many years. This image shows you the small hyphae that is seen with the dimorphic fungi. It's difficult to see the septations in here, but they are septate. The dimorphic fungi have colonial morphologic features that vary depending upon the isolate that you recover and also the medium on which they're recovered. So you need to become familiar with what an organism looks like on a certain medium. Colonies of histoplasma and blastomyces are pretty much indistinguishable from each other. And so there is a problem there, but for some of the others it's not so much of a problem. You can kind of get an idea of what the organism is by looking at the colonial morphologic features, but it's not absolute either. This discussion will center on paracoxidioidomycosis and also penicillosis. They're found in two different parts of the world. Dimorphic fungi usually have specific geographic niches in the world, and these are no exception. Paracoxidioidomycosis is found in Central and South America, and penicillosis is found in places like Vietnam and in Thailand. We will discuss these two organisms and the infection that they cause. And this is an example of a colony of Paracoxidioides brasiliensis. It's not a very good example, but it's a colony of white organism that turns a little bit tan with age, and it may look like blastomyces. In fact, it used to be called South American blastomycosis. This is a subculture. You can see how slow growing it is, and the colonies here are kind of white off white. This is a culture that we had here at Mayo, the only, only positive culture that we've ever had from a patient with paracoxioides infection. The colonies appear to be yeast-like, and they're kind of donut-shaped, like one of the slides we showed with blastomyces yeast form. But these are seen with a primary culture of paracoxioides. This is a, a, another plate of the same culture. You know, this plate contains a blood enrichment, and you can see these colonies are he kind of wrinkled up and almost donut shaped. Here you see the same culture on another medium and there the colonies are bacteria in the background that are shiny but all the other colonies that are kind of uh, brownish colored that are heaped up and wrinkled are all colonies of the yeast form of paracoxidioides. Not things you see discussed in the literature. You can see another one here where you see the primary recovery and notice the difference in morphologic features of this one. This is all paracoxidioides. And these are four plates showing you the difference in morphology features of 
paracoxidoides on these different media and you can it's hard to see the ones with blood containing medium because they are so dark with paracoxidoides what are you going to look for to try to make an identification well it's not that easy for us in, in the United States to make an identification of paracoxidoides because we rarely ever see it although patients come here with that infection and so you you may see it the hyphae are generally small just like we talked about it may contain numerous chlamydoconidia it's often sterile Sporulation doesn't happen very often. The canidia, whenever they're produced, are born on the sides of hyphae or in short canidia forests. They're kind of oval to pear shaped, and you may find arthroconidia. It looks like just a mishmash of all sorts of things. If you suspicion that this is what this is based on the history of travel of the patient, you will look at it and you probably try to put it at 35 to 37 degrees centigrade as well to see if it will convert to the yeast form. Well, right here you see in a, an image with a mass of hyphae and partially converted yeast cells. There's some round cells in there and there are pieces of hyphae sitting around in there. It's kind of nondescript. Everything's nondescript in there. What happens is once you convert to the yeast form, you see yeast cells that are 2 to 30 microns in size. That's a pretty broad range. And they produce narrow neck buds all the way around the perimeter of a yeast cell. It looks like what we call a mariner's wheel, like on a boat. The colonies are off white, they're wrinkled and folded, and they can look like those of blastomyces, and the mold to yeast conversion may be accomplished, but uh, there's something else we've found out over the years that we can use, and that's a blastomyces probe that's available commercially. It can be used to identify paracoxidoides if you, if you have other features to go along with it, because the blastomyces probe cross-reacts with paracoxidioides. Some people see this as a detriment of this particular probe. We see it as an advantage in being able to help identify that organism even though it's uncommonly seen. Now the, uh, the blastomyces probe uh, cross reacts with a couple of other things as well and so the people feel that the probe is not specific enough but our experience it has been. This is an incomplete conversion of Paracoxidoides brasiliensis. And if you look carefully in there, what you're seeing are yeast cells. That one in the center is kind of cup shaped, it's collapsed. And they really are kind of nondescript. A couple of them are in there. There's one in about 10 o'clock down towards the center is in chains. So, really, not a lot there to tell you what that is anything in particular. This next image, it looks like a moth eaten image, but basically, what's in there in the center. A little bit to the right of center is a big round blue cell that has these tiny buds coming off all the way around the outside. And basically in three dimension, those little tiny buds come off all the way around the whole cell. And that's what paracoxidioides looks like. It has these multiple buds all the way around this perimeter, this, this central yeast cell. And sometimes they're not as pretty as textbooks show them. The real world is not the textbook world. Here you can see a couple of cells in there, and one in the center that's large has little tiny buds coming off in about four places. Not the best one, but when you start looking through the, the thing, this is just to show you just browsing through all the fields. This is what we ran across. And then you look around in there and you say, well, I see some buds coming off the one in about four o'clock down there, coming about three or four buds coming off there, but it sure doesn't look all that good. And then you look up here and you see a big cell with some other cells coming off and that still doesn't look all that good. And then you get down to this one and you start to see multiple budding cells on some of those in there. To get a larger view, there's what it looks like. The buds are coming off all the way around the perimeter of a central yeast cell that's large. And that's Paracoxidioides brasiliensis. And there's probably the world's largest one. And this is another example here. Look at all the yeast cells that are coming off all the way around that central yeast cell itself. This is a scanning electron micrograph uh, to show you what it really does look like. A high power view. The buds do come off all the way around in three dimension. The next image you see here is Penicillium marnefi. Penicillium marnefi is a dimorphic fungus, but it's different from all the rest of them. The others are called what we refer to as thermally dimorphic. In other words, their conversion from one form to another is dependent upon the temperature. This one doesn't necessarily depend upon that. This is a colony of Penicillium marnefi. It looks like a nondescript colony. 
it is a colony of penicillium that can be green and it will have a red reverse a red back on it and if you look at it underneath the microscope you see there's a head of penicillus it has divergent phyllids on there and they give rise to chains of penicillium like structures just like another penicillium and not all penicillium cultures that are red are penicillium marnefi most of the time you're going to be able to make the identification by looking at a clinical specimen that's in, that has the organism in it but in terms of looking at the morphology what you're going to see are small conidial heads on short stalks you know three to five divergent metulae these are the branches that are produced before the phylogeny are produced to give rise to the chains of conidia the conidia are produced in long divergent chains with prominent disjunctures between the conidia you'll see a space between them and a conversion shows irregular hyphal fragments in cylindrical arthroconidia. And what you do at a conversion is, is you can take brain heart infusion broth and try to convert this organism from its mold form to its yeast form. And when it's converted, you will see that the hyphal cells become shorter and septate and branched to form these rectangular kind of arthroconidia looking things. They have a cross septation in the middle. And some of them look a little bit sausage shaped and reproduction is by fission and it's kind of prominent you'll see what it looks like but it's it's kind of hard to find this is a yeast cell a penicillin marnefi in a patient who had uh, infection this is this is blood and hard to see in there but in the very center is kind of, of a rectangular cell that has a septum in the center there's one that looks a little bit sausage shaped You'd have to enlarge these tremendously to be able to see them because they are about the same size as histoplasma, two to five microns. In fact, some people say that they're easily confused. I don't think they are. This next image shows you a cluster of penicillin marnefi yeast cells, if they are yeast, where they're yeast-like cells. Notice in there they're elongated and they have a central septum in them, and they're divided up in half by this septum. You can see the one on the right-hand side about two o'clock on that one that one cluster and that's what you see in clinical specimen with penicillin marnefi and they're awfully small you can see on this one the same thing there's a central cell in that one that is about two o'clock in the center and you can see on this one the top cell in the center has that distinct septum this is what penicillin marnefi looks like this is a biopsy and you can see in here it's a little bit out of focus but there are cells like about at 2 o'clock that is the parallel to the, the longitudinal axis of this thing. You see one with a septum in it. So this is what penicillin marnefi looks like. 